Good evening. My name is Sheila Riggs, and I am Vice Chairman of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Uh, our guest this evening is the Ambassador from New, New Zealand to the United States, the Right Honorable Sir Wallace Rowling. Most of us think of New Zealand as being a country of extraordinary natural beauty, the place which Rudyard Kipling called the Happy Isles where sheep outnumber people 20 to 1. But it is also a land of intense political conviction whose government has declined to allow American naval vessels to dock in its ports because New Zealanders do not want nuclear arms uh, in their country. Relations between our two countries for almost five decades have revolved around mutual security concerns and have been marked by cooperation first during World War II and second during the uh, Cold War. However, the firm ends its alliance um, in the South Pacific has been shaken by the anti-nuclear weapons posture of New Zealand's government under Prime Minister David Lang. This and the Greenpeace incident have brought unusually intense public uh, attention to New Zealand and to her foreign policy. With all of us, it's a land that many of us know very little about. Uh, certainly, Sir Wallace is a, as impressive a messenger as New Zealand could send to us, and I am sure that before we leave, we will have learned a great deal. He comes from a family which is steeped in the traditions of New Zealand's Labour Party. His father was a close personal friend and advisor to many members of the first Labour Cabinet, which held power between 1935 and 1949. Sir Wallace himself holds a master's degree in economics and is a former Fulbright scholar. In fact, as a Fulbright exchange teacher during the 1950s, he taught uh, junior high school students in Seattle, so he's very familiar with our country. He was initially elected to New Zealand's parliament in 1962. He has served as president of the Labour Party and held the finance portfolio in the cabinet of Norman Kirk. In 1974, he was elected prime minister of New Zealand and held the post of minister of foreign affairs at the same time. He was leader of the Labour Party in opposition from 1975 to 1983 and was knighted by the Queen in June of 1983. He presented his credentials as New Zealand's ambassador to the United States this past March. Ambassador Rowling will speak until 6.30 and will field questions until 7.10. I am delighted then to have the honor on behalf of the council of introducing him to you now, the Right Honorable Sir Wallace Rowling. Uh, Chairperson Sheila, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the welcome that you've extended to us this evening and thank you for being here in such large numbers because that means it's a much more exciting experience for me. And I'm quite pleased to be here on behalf of my country to uh, give a New Zealand perspective on certain things and maybe even keep the record straight on certain matters because uh, we're quite happy to have United States naval vessels in New Zealand ports. <laughs> that policy stands. We just don't like nuclear weapons and that's quite another matter which I shall discuss perhaps a little later on. I was, as the chairperson indicated, for many years involved in politics and when I retired I had but a short period of retirement before I found myself in quite a different role that of a diplomat, at least that's what I'm called. <laughs> I had to check out to see what a diplomat was and I found that it's a nice blend of protocol, alcohol and geritol. <laughs> <laughs> the trick is to get the blend right, so I understand. <laughs> I had the good fortune to be uh, speaking to the Rotary Club here in Baltimore earlier today and I was telling them then that someone had asked me if 
the cares and woes of office and particularly the problems of the moment were a matter of great concern to me. Uh, didn't it worry me a great deal? And I suggested that that wasn't entirely true, that uh, you know, when I went to bed at night, I slept like a baby. I slept for an hour, I cried for an hour, and then I <laughs> slept for an hour. And And so it went on. But I'm here to talk about somewhat more serious things tonight and certainly to give you an opportunity to question me on matters about which you're concerned, on matters which you feel that I may be able to give you a little uh, additional information. And I'm delighted that the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs has given me this platform. Obviously, it's a very lively organization, but then one might expect that because this city, steeped in history, is also a city that is very vital in terms of its activities in modern times. And so I guess the mood of the council really in its own way reflects the kind of mood that I've found here. A fairly cursory reading of United States newspapers in 1985 would suggest, I guess, that New Zealand's foreign policy is limited to concern about nuclear bombs and ships. But we don't like bombs, I want to tell you that. And when a ship gets blown up in one of our harbours, we get particularly angry. <laughs> and at present, because of things like this, we seem to be in difficulty with some of our great power friends. And as you would expect, some questions are being asked. Questions like, surely a small country should know its place. <laughs> Don't we realise that by challenging the safety of the nuclear umbrella, that we are in fact imperiling our own security? Don't we realise that by challenging the might of France, we're imperiling our butter sales in Europe? Now such comments as these might well characterise the popular perceptions of New Zealand's foreign policy. And like all caricatures, I guess they have a grain of truth in them. But for the sake of our national reputation, and for truth itself, I'd like to paint a somewhat broader picture this evening of what I would describe as our real foreign policy. Let me tell you that I don't want to ignore the ships and bombs issue and I'll be most prepared to answer questions on these or any other matters that are of concern at the end of my address. But for the moment I do want to look at some of the wider implications of the foreign policy issues themselves. New Zealand is a small country. It's a small country in the centre of the ocean. In geographical terms to many people it seems to be pretty well at the end of the world. And though we have a living population of about 92 million, it is true that 77 million of them are sheep, 12 million are cattle, <laughs> and only 3 million are people. <laughs> but we are by nature a peace-loving, law-abiding and friendly people, as I'm sure people among you tonight who've been there will bear witness. At the same time, we've been deeply involved in every major conflict in this century and several others beside. I mentioned to someone the other day, I think the only thing we've been left out of since the turn of the century are a couple of scraps in the Bronx that they've got to tell us about. <laughs> but we've been heavily involved in World War II. In relation to our population, New Zealand had the highest casualty rate other than the Soviet Union of any nation involved in that war. We're also by tradition, by necessity, and by commitment, a firm believer in a system of international relations which allows all nations to prosper and flourish peacefully and equitably. Let me expand those comments just a little bit further. By tradition, New Zealand as a nation was born at a time when trade was free and politics were liberal. Because of the time in which our nation was born, we didn't have to fight for our independence. But instead we evolved peacefully towards nationhood within the framework of the British Commonwealth. Unlike many other countries, we've not carried into the modern world any of the heavy baggage of imperialism. And with the exception of World War II, we've never really been even remotely threatened by another power nor have we had to expand or contract as our strength waxed and waned. Our foreign policy is relatively uncluttered by the past. We are at home 
in an interdependent world. Indeed, it's the only world that we as New Zealanders know. By necessity, New Zealand is 1,200 miles from Australia, 6,000 miles from our other two great trading partners, Japan and the United States, and 13,000 miles from our earlier traditional markets in Europe. We have never thought it possible or desirable that we should go it alone, either economically or politically. Our past and we believe our future prosperity all relate to an interaction with the rest of the world. If we want to maintain the standard of living to which we've become accustomed, and we do, then we have to trade, and we have to trade well. well. Any other policy would clearly be suicidal. And finally, by commitment. The policies that we apply in our own nation, we would at least wish to see applied to the international community generally. Respect for different cultures. A market philosophy tempered by the need to help those historically or geographically disadvantaged. A belief in peace and freedom. And a willingness to defend the values that we have accepted whether that requires us to send our forces to France, as we did in World War I, to the Middle East, as we did in World War II, or to Asia, as we have done in more recent times. Well, such are the principles and circumstances on which we base our foreign policy. Of course, you can say very properly, this litany of ideals and objectives sounds fine in theory, so fine that probably every country in the world, including the Soviet Union, could subscribe to it. So I'd like to give you a little bit more of a special flavour of New Zealand's foreign policy by looking as to how we apply those principles to three areas closest to us. Let me begin with Australia, which as I've indicated is 1,200 miles away by ocean at the nearest point. In fact, Perth, the capital of Western Australia, is further from our capital, Wellington, than San Francisco is from your great city of Baltimore. We only seem close to each other when you look at us from a distance. But both Australia and New Zealand have common histories of settlement by peoples from Britain, and we have evolved over the years a special, almost family-like relationship. That means we scrap a bit, you understand. <laughs> In recent years, this has been given a real spur by the need seen on both sides of the Tasman to strengthen the fabric of our economic relations. We had an earlier trade agreement known as NAFTA. But some 10 years ago, it had clearly reached the end of its useful life. And we had to look hard at our respective economies, at our common interests, and to work out a newer, closer economic relations agreement. It's interesting that it was originally conceived by parties that are now in opposition in both those countries. But it has been completely endorsed by the new governments that are now in office. The principle of CER, as we call it, that is closer economic relations, is simple. It is to remove all internal barriers to trade between Australia and New Zealand. In other words, each to open up our markets to the others. The changes which this new arrangement have brought are already begun to make their effects felt. Australia is by far the largest market for New Zealand manufactured exports while we take some 25% of theirs. That's to our advantage because we've got a population of 3 million, they've got a population of 14. The benefits on that basis seem to us to be the greater. But the real purpose of CER is not simply to turn New Zealand and Australia into a closed club of high cost economics, each trading with the other, but to make both economies more internationally competitive and as a result of greater interest to the rest of the world. New Zealand manufacturers, for example, realise that we cannot open our markets to Australia and yet retain a high degree of protection against the rest of the world. If we did that, Australia would simply move in and take over and we're not about to allow that to happen. And for a New Zealand manufacturer to complete, su compete successfully in Australia, he really has to be internationally competitive. And having discovered that they could live and flourish without the protection which we'd earlier provided, in the form of import licensing and tariff barriers, 
The manufacturers are now much better adjusted to dealing themselves into the marketplace of the world. The other side of this arrangement is the encouragement it gives to third parties to develop their trade with us both. And this is particularly relevant to our immediate neighbours in, South, in Southeast Asia, the members of the very successful group known as ASEAN. I'd have to tell you that at first they were suspicious. They perceived it to be a closed door situation simply between Australia and New Zealand. But it didn't take them long to appreciate the benefits that they were gaining from our move away from import licensing and towards a lower and more uniform set of tariffs. There is a limit, of course, to which a country, particularly a small country such as New Zealand, can unilaterally open itself up to foreign competition. But the underlying premise of the sort of changes in domestic and external economic policy that we've been introducing is that an efficient economy will be a competitive economy and will no longer therefore require the protective barriers of the past. To New Zealand's north lie a range of island nations from Papua New Guinea in the west to the Cook Islands in the east. And these along with Australia and New Zealand are members of the South Pacific Forum. And so we come to the second area of New Zealand foreign policy on which to wish to comment. Our association with the South Pacific Islands is almost as long and intimate as that with Australia. In recent decades, many South Pacific Islanders have moved to New Zealand. And what is not generally known is that Auckland, our largest city, though not our capital, is in fact by far the largest Polynesian city in the world. At the same time, New Zealand has been expanding its contacts with these states as they have moved to independence in a remarkably peaceful and trouble-free example of decolonization. New Zealand's task in the South Pacific is to assist the development of these island states, to cooperate with them in developing their political and economic stability. And there are several mechanisms whereby we can undertake this work. For example, the South Pacific is the principal recipient of New Zealand's overseas development assistance. 81% of our aid went there for the March year 1985. And this program covers a whole range of things, from technical assistance projects, cash grants, assistance for students, and budgetary support for three small states with which we have special constitutional ties. Along with Australia, we've established a non-reciprocal trade agreement with the island states that gives most of their exports duty-free access to both the Australian and New Zealand markets, and that's tremendously important for them. There are two broad considerations New Zealand has to bear in mind in dealing with these nations. The first is to avoid developments which would give the Soviet Union, or indeed any other opportuni opportunistic power, a chance to gain an improper foothold in the region. And the second is to ensure that the Western powers themselves, France, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Japan, are responsive to South Pacific concerns. This means that they, that is the great powers, should not put at risk the friendship of the island states by their actions on nuclear testing, the dumping of nuclear waste, or indeed attempts to control the fisher resources of our region. It is a fact that France has antagonized the South Pacific with its continued program of nuclear testing in French Polynesia. And recently that was compounded by the blowing up of the Green Police flagship, the Rainbow Warrior in a New Zealand port, and the murder of one of its crew, a shocking act of state-sponsored terrorism. <clears throat> the Pacific Forum nations have now themselves adopted a treaty declaring nuclear a nuclear-free zone for the South Pacific. And in support of that, we'll be asking the nuclear powers to sign certain protocols which will commit them not to test nuclear weapons in the region, not to use or to threaten to use nuclear weapons against a party to the treaty, and to apply the treaty's terms in respect of their own territories in the South Pacific. I can tell you, as you can properly understand, that the nations of the South Pacific await the response of the nuclear powers with a great deal of interest. The South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone 
abuts on its southern boundary with a territory covered by the Antarctic Treaty. And this is the third area on which I wish to briefly comment. With no permanent habitation, the frozen continent of Antarctica remained outside the realm of international activity until the turn of the century. In 1959, a group of 12 nations signed the Antarctic Treaty to provide for the peaceful use of the Antarctic for research and related activities. The countries which signed that treaty and which included both New Zealand and the United States were those which were already engaged in scientific research in the continent. Since then, that is since 1959, 19 other nations have acceded to the treaty and four of these which have been active in the continent have been granted the status of consultative parties giving them the right to participate with the original signatories in the management of Antarctica. That treaty did not contain any provision on the resources of Antarctica. It was considered too sensitive a subject. These, uncertain in extent, cannot be exploited without high risk of damage to this frozen environment. And so slowly but methodically, the gaps are being plugged. A convention has been concluded on the living marine resources of the Antarctic and negotiations are presently underway to construct a minerals regime. The Antarctic Treaty System is one of the best instances I know of the ability of the international community to work together towards a common end, namely the preservation of a unique environment. And I can tell you just an aside there that I had the privilege of visiting that continent some years ago and I sat down one day in the American mess at McMurdo Sound and at the table I was sitting I found myself in company with a number of Americans quite obviously, a Russian, an Australian, another New Zealander and an Argentinian. And I never on any occasion have seen people on more common ground than were those people and they couldn't have given a damn what the politicians were doing in the rest of the world. They had a purpose in life which they shared in a very remarkable and wonderful way. And we've got that treaty there. It guarantees that the continent will remain demilitarized and denuclearized. And this is obviously in harmony with New Zealand's own interests in the area. And we believe in harmony with the long-term interests of all other nations. It was interesting, I got asked a question today when I was visiting the Baltimore Sun about the nuclear plant that was in fact formerly at McMurdo Sound at the American base. And it was there, it was a power plant, it was put there both to provide power and initially, uh, it was hoped initially that it would develop into uh, the basis of a desalinization plant because water is a rather scarce commodity down there except in the frozen form. In the event, the economics of it, quite apart from anything else, were blown to bits. And that plant no longer operates. In fact, as I understand it, the material that largely constituted the plant had been withdrawn. And so the area is, in fact, totally denuclearized at the present time. Now, in telling you about aspects of New Zealand's foreign policy in areas close to home, I don't want to suggest that our interests are limited to our immediate region. We trade, for example, with over 170 countries. The interests that flow from that are matched by the genuine concern New Zealanders have for other global issues. Not just as they affect us, but as they affect everybody else. I really referred to the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone and to the denuclearization provisions of the Antarctic Treaty. Nuclear issues are of great concern to New Zealanders. The ever-increasing stockpiles of increasingly sophisticated nuclear weapons in recent years have become, to our minds, a greater threat to peace and security than any other phenomenon in the history of the world. We have been frustrated at the total lack of progress in arms control and disarmament, both between the nuclear powers and in the international forums generally. We want to make our contribution to the cause of world peace to the greatest extent that we as a tiny nation can. And we've done so not just by subscribing to the treaties I've mentioned, not just by agreeing to international codes such as the Non-Proliferation Treaty, 
but also by outlawing nuclear weapons from our territory. Now, unfortunately, that action has resulted in a disagreement with the United States, which, and that's the United States, does not wish, for reasons we fully understand and respect, to breach its policy of neither confirming nor denying whether any of its ships or aircraft carry nuclear weapons. I want to tell you that despite some difficult times this year, we are still hopeful that we can work out an arrangement that will enable United States naval vessels to resume visits to our ports in accordance with the policy of the United States and which also conforms to the policy adopted by the government of New Zealand as a result of a direction by the people of New Zealand in the ballot box at the last election. Now, um, at the time that we're negotiating this, we remain convinced that the security needs of the South Pacific will not be met or indeed helped by making that a further region of nuclear confrontation. Nuclear weapons will not promote the economic development of any of the small island states to which I have alluded. Nuclear weapons will not solve border problems between Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Nuclear weapons will not help to decolonize New Caledonia. They will not help to arrest the escalation of communist insurgency in the Philippines any more than they stem the tide in Vietnam. And we are not, by declaring ourselves nuclear free, opting out of the concern for the actual security in the problems of the South Pacific. We remain ready and willing to play an active role in dealing with those problems. We would be obviously that much more effective in doing that if we are working in close association with the United States and that is very much the clear preference of the great majority of New Zealanders. There are many more strands to New Zealand's foreign policy but I hope I've said enough tonight to give you some idea of our main preoccupations. We seek to balance concern for our own interests with those of the wider international community. We do, do so not in the expectation that we can reconcile the irreconcilable, but because we believe that a peaceful and a prosperous world is the best guarantee to our national interests. And my perception is that the fundamental values of the people of New Zealand are shared fully by those of the United States. And that's a mighty base on which to operate. I'd like to conclude by saying what a tremendous experience it has been for me as a New Zealander here representing my country, albeit at a time of some tension in one particular area, to have been so well received by people in the United States wherever I go. Sharp differences of opinion on policy issues, and that we are entitled to have. But never yet have I been spoken to by a single citizen of this country in a way that I would regard as offensive. And I think that in itself underlines the kind of relationship between our two peoples. I would be appalled if I learned of one of you people going to my country and being offended by something that was said to you on a personal basis by one of my fellow citizens. If we've got an issue to deal with, then let's deal with the issue and let's cling very strongly to the fundamental understanding the common set of values that we have striven for, that we have fought for, that we have believed in together for such a long period of time. Thank you very much. The question is, do I feel that if President Marcos had given people of the Philippines their civil rights and freedom, that he wouldn't have been regarded as a dictator. I'd be climbing very much into someone else's country, but I'm only going to say this, that New Zealanders are as unhappy as I guess most Americans are about the present state of affairs in the Philippines, and it is abundantly clear to us, as it is to you, that there indeed has to be a circumstance in the Philippines vastly better for the people of that country than presently pertains today or will have big trouble in that critical Pacific area. Would I come, the question is, would I comment on French, and tr French intransigence about nuclear testing? 
And the answer is, yes, I'd be delighted to. <laughs> if indeed anything has produced the high nuclear profile or anti-nuclear profile, I think is a better term, in the South Pacific or the Southwest Pacific, it is the actions of the French over the last 15 or 20 years in particular and their refusal to remove their testing from our part of the world and to take a lead from the United States and Britain when they in fact, uh, who had earlier tested in the Pacific, decided it was much more appropriate to go home and do their testing there. And that persistence on the part of the French has led to a number of things. Back in 1974, it led to New Zealand taking the French to the International Court. We were taking them at that time on the grounds that they were still atmospheric testing when no one else was, certainly not in our part of the world. We won that case and French, the French promptly withdrew from the International Court, unfortunately sending a nasty precedent for other big powers. <laughs> but the fact was that they did not test in the atmosphere again. But they did persist in underground testing. They continue in their claims that the testing is perfectly safe. And the attitude of the people of the South Pacific is that if it is safe, as the French assure it, it is, then I'm quite sure they'd find somewhere on the environs of Paris <laughs> where they could get on with the job and it wouldn't disturb us. But if you're looking for a reason why New Zealanders and their neighbours are particularly vehement on the nuclear question at this moment and indeed have caused problems between our two countries which hurt us both, then you wouldn't have to go very far outside of Paris to find the root cause of the problem. And I'll leave it at that. <coughs> question, could I comment on the role of local peace groups in New Zealand in the promotion of the nuclear-free question? There are many groups, and they're quite diverse, that have been active over the years in New Zealand. The most influential and powerful in my mind have been the doctors of medicine. I represented for some 22 years a essentially rural constituency, small <coughs> rural villages and where the general practitioner was the father figure for a lot of people. And there were any number of these general practitioners in that constituency that I represented. 80% of those were members of the Physicians Against Nuclear War. And they were strong in their advocacy of the New Zealand position, even though they were regarded in their communities as essentially conservative in their general political stance. They were much more influential, for example, in my mind, than were the politicians. Because when they some, say something, then people want to know what's, what's, you know, what's, the, what's behind it, uh, what's the next step. But there are also many other groups of anti-nuclear activists representing all walks of life, who encourage local authorities throughout the length and breadth of New Zealand to at least make the symbolic gesture, and it was no more than that, of course, for a local authority, to declare their areas nuclear-free. The consequence of that was that by the time of the last general election in New Zealand in July 1984, some 80% of the local authorities throughout the length and breadth of New Zealand, that is city councils, county councils, borough councils, and one or two cases regional councils had passed such a resolution. The interesting thing was that in terms of political background, I would say that at least 80% of the local authorities in New Zealand are also uh, have a very clear conservative majority in political terms, domestic political terms in their ranks. But that indicated, I think, both the breadth and the depth of feeling in New Zealand and probably uh, you can understand that many of the anti-nuclear activists at least felt they could take a degree of credit for that situation. Question, besides a frozen leg of lamb, what does New Zealand export to the United States? <laughs> a lot of things, it's perfectly true that our traditional exports to the United States are in the areas of agriculture and more recently horticulture. That is lamb, 
in dairy products, not butter, because uh, we would run the last remnants of the American dairy farmer out of business on economics. But cheese, certainly. Uh, casein, which is a milk derivative, which is used for a whole range of things as a raw material in this country. Um, beef, um, manufacturing beef. And we have a very good amicable working arrangement with the Cattlemen's Association, I might say. It, it, we work together very closely. Uh, then we move into what are the non-traditional areas, and this is where things are really booming at the moment. An obvious one, when you're talking in a, in a, in a port city, is, is boats, sailing boats particularly. And we have now a very big industry on both coasts uh, for the sale of sailing boats of all sizes and dimensions. Um, specialist areas, roofing tiles. We have a firm uh, based now in Texas uh, who sell roofing tiles throughout the United States and such is their business that they're now going to have to establish on the ground in order to possibly cope with American orders. Plastics, you wouldn't expect New Zealand to be in the plastics industry, but Paragon Plastics, uh, situated in Seattle, has act absolutely boomed since it came there because they are cost effective on the American market. And then you can go into a whole range of small manufactured products of various kinds. Trade is booming between our two countries. It's been to the advantage of the United States. In 14 of the last 15 years, including this year, you have a favorable balance of trade with New Zealand, and we are almost unique in that, in that category. <laughs> but, but trade is, is really lifting. Uh, your trade to our country increased by $630 million. May not seem that much, but given the size of our country, in the last year, that increase of $630 million is quite big. Even more dramatic, looking at it the other way around. In the June year, the June trading year, our trade in dollar terms, the United States, for the single year increased by 49%. It is really booming on both sides, and it is now a, a whole multitude of products from berry fruits, which I didn't mention. You can buy New Zealand blueberries out of season over here, or raspberries, or, or fruits of those kinds, uh, right through to the to the sailboats, the plastic products, uh, the roofing tiles. Uh, it's quite a range of things. The question, New Zealand has been noted to be in the vanguard for providing democratic, uh, democratically arrived at, I guess, benefits for its people. Could I comment? And the answer is yes. First of all, New Zealand is a very vigorous democracy. And when I tell you that when we have an election, uh, more than 90% of our people eligible to vote, vote, you will understand that politicians have to take notice of the ballot box or they're in trouble. And that is important and it's healthy. And so the people have, by and large, told the politicians the way they want to go, not have the politicians tell the people where they're going to lead them. And I've had some difficulty explaining that in Washington. You keep on telling me, you go and tell your people they've got this, this wrong and the government will be able to do it. Well, it just doesn't work that way in a vigorously democratic country. The people tell the politicians, and that's the way it's supposed to be, and long may it remain that way. But in, in certain areas, New Zealand does claim um, a degree of leadership, and it has usually come not from the political arena, but from people in the general mass of the population. Um, Health care for um, small babies, what we call the Plunkett Society in New Zealand which took us right to the top of the tree in order in defeat of infant mortality. The late Sir Truby King was a person that had nothing to do with politics, who originated that but fired the imagination of people of New Zealanders who supported him. In the 1930s, we inaugurated a social security system which really has been followed, not always terribly well, but, but uh, in many other parts of the world, it's been fragmented over the years, but basically there are still some very important and critical elements to it. For example, uh, a mother uh, going into a maternity hospital in New Zealand does not have to worry about any payment, and she doesn't have to escape from the hospital too soon if she's not feeling up to it because of the, the bills that are accumulating. Indeed, in the general hospital system in New Zealand, which is good, there is no payment for bed space, there is no payment for surgical uh, for, for surgeons that are required for operations, no matter what the degree of difficulty for that operation might be. There is a partial payment of 
a doctor's fee. Uh, back in the 30s, that was a full payment. Now it is only a full payment for aged people and for small children. The rest of the population make a part payment. In terms of prescribed medicines, some of those are on a full prescription, some of them are on parts pres prescription. It depends on the kind of need, but you know, some people are required to go back for a constant repeat of, um, of medicine because of the nature of their problem, and it can be pretty difficult if your income is low. That is generally dealt with. In more recent years, one of the more exciting developments, and which is now being looked at by the rest of the world, is a, a scheme of accident compensation. Now, other countries have had accident compensation. Indeed, Wisconsin State was the first in this country, had accident compensation in 1911. This is somewhat more comprehensive. It provides that where a worker is injured to the point where they cannot continue work, they will receive a payment equivalent to 80% of that which they received when they were in work. But it reaches beyond that. It reaches into the home. If, for example, a mother who's going about her business, looking after the house and climbs up on a kitchen stool to get something down for the, for the kitty and falls off and breaks her leg, it is clearly, clearly uh, clear that she's incapacitated and she needs someone in the home to look after things while she is so indisposed. And the accident compensation under those circumstances will pick up the payment because the family have deemed to have lost income because they have to pay out to someone else to look after the house. So it's fairly, it's fairly comprehensive. It's paid for by contributions from employer and employee and is now being copied in, in many other parts of the world. It was again a policy that was introduced by one government in New Zealand and carried further through by succeeding governments. It has no partisan flavour about it at all. It was simply perceived to be something that was worthwhile. And so in areas like that, along with education, uh, we really have tried to keep our place reasonably, reasonably up front as far as world developments are concerned. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your comment. The question that followed the comment, the comment's a very nice comment about New Zealand, I applaud it completely. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the question was, you know, you have this incredibly high percentage of valid votes. Um, how is it that you manage to achieve this? Do you have compulsory voting as in Australia or is there some other motivation? And the answer is we don't have compulsory voting in New Zealand. It is compulsory to be on the electoral roll, but there are people who do not vote for religious and other reasons, and they're not required to, nor indeed is anyone else required to uh, if it's just sheer idleness. I, I guess it's just that they want to keep a close eye on the politicians down there. And that's not quite as facetious as it sounds. You see, New Zealand has no constitution. And New Zealand has a unicameral government. There is no upper house. We had one, but we decided that was a luxury we could ill afford, so we abolished that back in the 1950s. And that was a conservative government that abolished it too. So really the, the reign that the elector has on the government, with unicameral government and with no constitution, is the ballot box. It is important, and I believe that most New Zealanders, we growl about New Zealanders being apathetic. But I think they perceive that, really, that it's, it's very fundamental. My constituency, again, which is, was rural, as I mentioned, always returned about a 94% vote. And I needed them because it was a marginal seat. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, seemed to me to relate to the question of disarmament, really, if I could phrase it in another way and tell me if I got it wrong, does New Zealand believe in unilateral disarmament is, is a way of leading the, the question. Is it, would that be fair? And the answer is no, we don't. We're not that naive or trusting uh, that we subscribe to unilateral disarmament. We just simply do not think that would work. What we would obviously like to see is some very clear initiative from one or more of the superpowers that starts the step back from the brink of what we regard as a precipice on which we are poised at the moment. Those steps will need to be carefully taken. We hope, like I guess everyone in this room, that the summit which is imminent 
will see the first of those steps. We would have to be convinced because we've seen summits before, we've seen treaties before, we've seen agreements before. And we look at the end result and we're not impressed. But nevertheless, it's being tried again and we applaud the initiative of the United States in actually bringing together this situation where once again it is being tried. And we hope that it will lead to the first of the significant steps back from the situation where we find ourselves. Can I the question is that I mentioned the summit talk as a, a real hope for us that we'll start to move back on the, on the armament question. What other recommendations do we have? Well, quite frankly, we are in the, in the hands of, we being all of us, of the superpowers on the nuclear question. And the only other, other recommendation that I really think I can strongly make is that when nations like New Zealand or any other country subscribe to treaties as we subscribe, for example, to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, they honour their, they honour their signature. And that's really all we're doing in our, in our country. And we would hope that other nations would honour their commitment. And I think that's a useful start while the, the big boys eyeball it out. Well, the question relates, first of all, it was tacked on to the French intransigence and then asked me um, really to relate that to US nuclear policy in the Pacific and specifically islands like Palau were mentioned. Uh, we perceive this still to be a matter of negotiation uh, between the island people in that area and the United States. Uh, we are hopeful that those issues which are currently before Congress will be resolved in reasonably short order and that the uh, countries in the Micronesian area will be given their dependence in a way that's agreeable both to them and to the United States because the interaction obviously between those small countries and their mother country is tremendously important. And at that point uh, we would expect, because we know they've already made overtures, that those countries will come in to the South Pacific Forum but um, we would not, in the forum, be disposed uh, to intervene between the negotiations which we see at the moment as properly taking place uh, between the United States and those areas, even though I, I take the point about the tensions and so on that exist, but those are resolvable situations in our view. Question, just this weekend, a questioner noticed that Russia had signed a fishing agreement with one of the Pacific Islands are we concerned in New Zealand that this is the thin end of the wedge to get a base into the South Pacific? The short answer to the question is no. But let's go a little bit further than that. The country concerned is Kiribati, spelt Kiribati. The, it is not the first fishing agreement that the Russians have in the Pacific. They've had one with New Zealand for years. And there's no way they're going to get a base in our country. And I'll tell you there's no way I believe that they're going to get a base in Kiribati. But I can tell you also that if the American fishing interest had played the game a lot earlier, the Russians wouldn't have been there in the first place. And that unfortunately is the simple truth as the administration here now acknowledges. The Kiribatians and the Kiribatians and most indeed of those island countries around there are members of the Pacific Forum. Almost all of them are governed by people who are educated in New Zealand. They're not only friends, they're part of our family. They are fiercely pro-Western. They are equally fiercely democratic. They are concerned for the well-being of their people and if they need to enter into a, an agreement which will assist economically their country and which involves the USSR without the USSR getting the toehold about which you concern, I share that concern, if they did, then they will do it. The same way as the United States has signed grain agreements with the Soviet Union, it is competent for Kiribati to sign a fishing agreement with them. The question, New Zealand's a pleasant country, uh, seems to have a strong economy, how do you account for the small population? Well, I 
suppose the simple truth is people are not very good swimmers. It's a long way to get there. But <laughs> <laughs> we do have a tough immigration policy. In my view, it's too tough, but it is tough. It is, in earlier days, it essentially was orientated towards the United Kingdom, and we drew the great bulk of our early settlers from that point. But the immigration policy today does not recognise um, any kind of ethnic barrier. Uh, it does not give any preference to country of origin, including the United Kingdom. It selects people on the basis of age and skill, the emphasis being on skill. And the only two notable exceptions, I can three I can think of to that, are the refugee population, I'll refer to that just a moment, a little more, people who are being reunited with, re reunited with their families who will be given preference to come into the country, and a handful of people who come in because they have a particular entrepreneurial deal which appeals to New Zealand as helping to expand and give greater diversification uh, to our economy. But at the moment we wouldn't be bringing in more than 20 to 25,000 people a year. I mentioned uh, refugees because I want here to make the point that New Zealand in recent times, particularly since the difficulties in Southeast Asia, has accepted the refugee population into New Zealand in relation to our own population on a greater basis than almost any country in the world. And we're a tiny country, but it so happens that now we have one in every thousand of our people was born in Indochina. And we accepted a considerable number of the boat people, and more recently we have been taking in a regular intake from Kampuchea and some of the other areas of difficulty. We recognize our international responsibilities in that respect. And I might say, that you have found here, in the United States, most of those people are pretty darn good citizens and they get on with the job in the community. So we've not been the loser in that respect. But yes, we do have a tough immigration policy. I think it's, I think it's too tight. And I hope uh, in the future that they'll just give a little bit more elbow room because I think it would give an additional vigor to New Zealand to have a slightly at least larger flow of people coming in with their ideas, with their skills, and being able to give a new dimension to a country which is so far away, it's always a little bit of danger of becoming a bit insular. <laughs> new Zealand sounds so sensible, the questioner wouldn't be surprised if we had a balanced budget too. I wish I could say yes to that. But I, I do want to make a couple of points because there have been some very dramatic changes in New Zealand. When the new government took over in 1984, of course the first thing that hit the headlines was the nuclear question. And I think a lot of people in the United States, particularly in Washington, thought some kind of neo-Marxist outfit had taken over, and that was the end of that country. But they've been more perplexed in dealing with their economic policy that the new Labour government has introduced, which has been to get rid of vir virtually every control that exists. Just after they came in, they devalued the dollar, they got rid of uh, interest rate controls, they got rid of foreign exchange controls, they floated the New Zealand dollar on a free float. They are dismantling totally both uh, consumer and producer subsidy systems. Uh, they've just in the last two days announced that they're opening the, um, the banking structure to the wide world. I'm not too sure here in Maryland whether everyone had applauded that, but I'll <laughs> just pass that on for your information. Two things came out of that. We've been stagnant as far as growth is concerned. In the last financial year, our growth dramatically rose to 7.8% in real terms, and that's big growth. And in that same financial year, the internal deficit, which was pretty high, was cut clean in half. Um, so they're working on the question, but they haven't got the yes answer yet. The question has asked me about the publication Update. Update is a, uh, is a little regular journal uh, pamphlet that we put out from the embassy Originally, we were putting out for New Zealanders who were in the United States. But now, by far the greater part of our mailing list are United States citizens who have expressed an interest in knowing what's going on in New Zealand. The questioner says, look, could you lighten it up a bit? Uh, I think the point's made, and we were talking about this just in the last 24 hours at the embassy, I can tell you that, with a view to seeing if we can give it a bit more light and shade. The difficulty is we're, we're, we're trapped a little bit. We don't just want to put out news that's of interest to expatriate New Zealanders. We want to put out information that is of news and of value to a wide range of Americans too. 
And of course, the more worthy it is, the more solid it tends to be. But I'll take the point and see if we can lighten up a bit. <laughs> the question is, are we still in, I indicated we were still in negotiation over the port visits. Would I give specific details? The answer is that we're still talking. Uh, we're not in strong negotiation, but I'm hopeful that soon we will be. Can I give you specific details? The answer is no. <laughs> One at a time. Um, I think before we, I, I wonder if you might follow up on that question, since the, the one controversy that seems to exist between our two nations is that question of the uh, use of the ports, and uh, without, and leaving to the side any suggestion that New Zealand doesn't carry her, her load eagerly and, and well, um, could you perhaps share with us what you think are the soundest arguments presented by the United States government concerning her reasons? for wishing to indeed continue to have the freedom of having uh, uh, ships which perhaps might have nuclear weapons uh, calling your ports. And then perhaps comment on uh, those arguments which you think are the best we can make. Well, I, I think it's a fair question, but what amendment do I shelter behind? Uh, you see, the reason I say I need to shelter behind an amendment is that every time we have attempted to interpret uh, a United States viewpoint on questions like this, we have it transpired slightly misinterpreted it and created uh, more difficulties than we have created light. And I really feel that that's a question you've got to direct to the administration, not to me. I've got an interpretation of, of, of what I perceive to be what they want to do, and what they want to achieve, and I must tell you there's a lot of goodwill on both sides, a tremendous amount. But the interpretation of what is most important, what is less important, what is exactly the objective, is the one area where we keep on getting ourselves into difficulty. And I fear that if I trespass on that ground, I'm just going to repeat, I'm going to show I'm a slow learner, that's what I'm going to show. <laughs> and I, I just want to disprove that. I think from, I can only say that from New Zealand's point of view, we want to see a resumption of ship visits. We have no doubt about that at all. We don't perceive that logistically the ships, the kind of ships that come to us, have a need for nuclear weaponry in any event. We are quite prepared to accept ships that would be nuclear capable, providing in our perception they're not nuclear armed. We are not going to challenge the neither confirm nor deny policy. We're not going to ask, nor have we ever asked, contrary to certain newspaper assertions, the Americans to disclose whether a ship was or was not armed. We are going to take that responsibility on ourselves and with the best intelligence that we have, make a decision, well before the event I might say, on request as to whether a ship may or may not enter port. Incidentally, a request is always made well in advance, doesn't matter what the ship is. Ships, even if allies, don't just go wandering into other nations' ports willy-nilly. They, you know, there are weeks ahead, uh, the lead time on these things. And we could make a decision without discomfort, I think, on that. There has been a suggestion that if we allow a, a, a ship in and say that in our opinion that this ship is nuclear free, we're telling the world and particularly the Soviet Union that this ship is nuclear free. Well, I can't believe that our intelligence structure is any better than the Soviet Union. So uh, in other words, <laughs> if we think it, was, it hasn't got a nuclear weapon on, I'm sure they thought that a long time before we did. <laughs> However, that's really as far as I can take it. Well, for a very comprehensive statement of New Zealand's policy, which I think was thoroughly entertaining as well, and for a pleasant evening, we thank you very much. Sir.